Welcome to People Doing Good for Others. Good morning. This is People Doing Good for Others, and I'm Gary York, and I thank you for being with us today. I want to thank Wilkes Communications, River Street Productions, and the 100.9 WIFM for this opportunity. People Doing Good for Others will praise and honor and celebrate and hold in the light those who are truly making significant differences. And again, I am so grateful for this opportunity. Our featured guest today is Jody Call. He's a 16-year veteran here at Wilkes Communications. He's the chief technical officer. He leads uh, the operations of the company. Tremendous community advocate, a big, good family man. He's a graduate of Wilkes Central High School, Wilkes Community College, Gardner-Webb University, with a master's from ASU. So uh, please uh, be ever mindful of the opportunities that you'll enjoy today by getting to know Jody Call. Good morning to you. Good morning. Thank Thanks. you Thanks very much. Me, and uh, let's go back to growing up here and some NASCAR roots, if you will. Yeah, so I grew up on Speedway Road, just about a thousand feet from North Wilkesboro Speedway. And my earliest memories of being around there about four or five years old, sitting on the back stretch of my mom and dad's Chevy Impala, I think it was like a 67, light blue Impala, and watching the race. And, and people would always ask me, is it really loud being near the racetrack? And I said, well, I really don't know because I was always there during the races. I would tag along behind my dad, my dad, my uncle, um, my grandfather were all employees at the Speedway. Um, doing maintenance, construction, masonry work, general upkeep of the track in between the, the racing seasons. As you know, we had a race in the spring and a race in the fall, so yeah. we usually had six months of work to do. And so I, I worked there, held on to my dad's coattails, and, and learned a lot. And if you've ever worked for family, you know how hard it is to work for family. It's the toughest job ever, and, and you almost feel like nothing you can do is right, but I learned so much from working with my dad there. Yeah. And um, under the leadership of Enoch Staley. Who's you know, he? Enoch Staley was the, the president and uh, owner or half owner of North Wilkesboro Speedway. And he was the one who worked with Bill France Sr. with NASCAR to get NASCAR started. And actually North Wilkesboro Speedway uh, opened in 1946 and it was the oldest speedway on the circuit. Unfortunately, it closed in 1996. but. I have a lot of great memories from that place, and I still dream about the place a lot. I hold it very near and dear to my heart. And in working there, I began working in the summers, full-time in the summers, uh, when I was 13, turning 14, doing construction, being a grunt, janitor work, and uh, learned a lot in, in how to do carpentry, and I still use that today, and my dad and I still do a lot of carpentry work together at the house wow. doing projects. And um, so for, he was your role model. Yeah, my dad is a role model, tremendous role model. He he can do anything. It's anything with his hands. Uh, he can build anything from sheds to houses just by what what he sees in his mind instead of having to have a blueprint. Part Goodness. of my education in engineering is to have a blueprint, and so. I'm usually drawing the blueprint after my dad's already started construction, and he says, I, I don't need to see the drawings, I know how I'm going to do this. So, And still, I'm that little kid in a way I can't know exactly all the tricks and secrets my dad knows about how to do something. So, although now I'm 45 years old. Almost, and his name is Ray? Yeah, Ray Call, Donald Ray, Ray Call. And your mother? Eunice Call, Eunice. Carrie Eunice okay. Call. She was an Anderson, yes. So growing so up, I also encourage you to go to school. Yeah, my, my mom did, um, and, and my dad both. As, as soon as I finished high school, I didn't know what I really wanted to do. I thought either I want to be a, a teacher or be an engineer. And, and so I went to Wilkes Community College, 
and very grateful for the program here. It's if, if it hadn't been for Wilkes Community College, I would not be in the job I'm, I'm in now sure. because I would not have been able to afford an opportunity for further education. And, and so I went here, I went for one year to do transfer because I wanted to be a teacher. And then after one year and still doing construction work at the Speedway as a full-time job as well, not just during the summer, I decided I need to do something to be able to get, get out into the workforce. And so I did a two-year degree in electrical engineering technology. And I finished that and left my job at the Speedway in 1995 and was eventually hired with Wilkes County Schools in early 1996. And Chuck Parker was the... Who's general, Chuck Parker? He was the Media and Technology Director for Wilkes County Schools. He was a lifelong educator. He saw something in me I didn't see in myself, and, wow. and he hired me. And he was a great leader as well, just as Enix Staley was. And, and so I've been blessed in, in my working past to have great leadership uh, to look up to and to learn from. And, and also, uh, to, I, to this day, I still look at situations and I think, how would Mr. Staley or how would Chuck Parker or Julie Triplett, for whom I also worked at the school system after Chuck Parker's retirement, I think, how would they have handled this situation? Because I admire how their methods of leadership uh, have impacted me. And also the same with Eric Kramer here at this company. Eric's a, a driving force with this yeah. company and he pushes us to our limits. Go but, back to NASCAR for yeah. a minute. Do you remember a driver that you that maybe patted you on the back or? Yes, uh, Richard Petty was always just so down to earth. He was like a family member uh, because Leading up to the, the race weekend, the drivers and the, the car haulers would come in on Thursday night. And Richard Petty and Kyle Petty's was two trucks, specifically Kyle Petty's hauler, the number 42 car. He would come up to the back gate and he would be the first one to park at the track crossover, waiting to get in. And the Staley's rules were we, they did not let any tractor trailers in, car haulers in, until the next morning at 6, 6 a.m on Friday for setting up for practice and qualification. But one year, and I think it was 1988, I was 14 years old, it was in the fall, uh, Richard Bostick was the tractor trailer driver, the car hauler, and also the jack man for Kyle Petty. And he had pulled up to the gate and I was doing some of my um, custodial work. And he said, hey, come here, come here. And I said, yeah, and he said, can you help me get in? And he was the only truck there at the time. And I said, I doubt it. I'm nobody. You know, I'm here, I, here I'm a 14-year-old kid doing grunt work. And he said, well, can you find out? And so I went over and I, I talked to Mr. Staley at the ticket office. And I was always afraid to talk to Mr. Staley. I mean, he was just, he, this guy was 6'5", six, 6'6". Six, six, and um, I'm, at that time, I was not as tall as he was. And, and it was just so intimidating. And I, and I told him, I said, there is a gentleman back here with uh, Petty Motorsports or Petty, Rich Petty Enterprises. And he wants to know if he can go ahead and park his truck in here tonight uh, because he's had a long drive. He doesn't want to be uh, awakened at six in the morning. And Mr. Staley said, yeah, we can let him in. And, and so I let the guy in. And he treated me like a king. He took me in the car hauler. He had a grill. He cooked food. I got to sit in the driver's lounge in the front of the, the truck. And then from then on, every race after that, on Thursday night, it was my job. I would go see the, the petty team and the car haulers to go ahead and let them in early. They were the only ones we would let in early. Oh my goodness, and so, Daddy. And I would meet, what a story. I would meet Richard Petty as well, and he would bring he would bring produce and canned food and share it with one of my uncles, uh, Bill Call. Bill would work the week before the speed, before the race. He would take time off from his job and he would paint the lines on the track. And Richard would come and, and they would exchange green beans for sauerkraut. And, and Richard would bring oh me hats word. and postcards. So he was, he was a true gentleman. Richard Petty. Richard Petty. Thank you for that. Yeah. All right, let's uh, now let's connect to uh, 
works communications yes. from the uh, school system yeah. and uh, yeah. You said you saw a little ad, a little classified yeah, so, ad. Yeah, that, when, when I was at school system, I'd been there almost 11 years and loved my job. It was, it was perfect job. And had, had employees whom I looked up to, uh, coworkers who welcomed me as soon as I came in, made me feel like family. And I had gone back to graduate school. And at the time, I'd also... Uh, started teaching at night for the community college at the prison over on um, 115 North Wilkesboro and it was to teach employability skills and ethics to help the students in the prison inmates inmates I called them students because okay. I'm okay. I didn't judge what Both. they did they were, they were to me to me they were a student sure no different to me, and I remember one, one of the guys had said, Mr. Call, you're, you're just one charge and a court date away from being where I am. And that resonated with me because everybody can make mistakes. And, and so I wow. saw these as equals to me, and maybe that I could offer something that would resonate with one person at least, I would hope. So anyway, I, I'd taken on this teaching position just to do it temporarily. It was Each time it was a 12-week class, three nights a week, two or three hours per night. And they had had someone leave the program, and I was filling in, but I fell in love with it, and it ended up happening for three years. And I remember in January of 2006, and, and so I've been here 13 years so in, instead of 16, but I remember January of 2006, I was preparing, looking over my lesson plan in the, in the classroom at the prison camp. And I had picked up a journal Patriot, and I typically didn't read the paper, but that day I just picked a paper up. And I'm looking at the classifieds for it to see if there's any tractor equipment or heavy equipment. I like to play around on a tractor. And I saw this small ad about one and a half inches by two and a half inches. It says, Wilkes Telephone Membership, or Wilkes Telecommunications at the time, is looking for a systems engineer, a network engineer. And, and I looked at that. And it piqued my curiosity. I just finished graduate school a month before. And so I made a call the next day, and the rest is history. I was hired April 3rd of 2006, and I've been here ever since. Jody Call, uh, this wonderful entity, this Wilkes Communications, this River Street, uh, its role, its community, uh, the substance of it. Tell us about the essence of this great company. Well, th and that's why it was so easy for me to transition from being a servant to the people, to the students, and to the staff at the school system in supporting technology. Is our company is a quasi-government entity because we, we're we're a utility. We provide services. And the whole reason we came about in 1951 was to serve the unserved with telephone service. Unserved. Unserved. People who had no telephone service. And, and that's how we came to be. A, a group of farmers came together. They started this company. And we've been going strong for 68 years. And so when I came here, I really quickly realized what all we offer to the community and how we give back. Any given week when I'm at work, I'm, I'm spending sometimes 10, sometimes 25, sometimes 50% of my time in community involvement. And I love that because I'm able to do that and, and we have the flexibility It's here. expected as part it of this expected. that you do that. It's expected, but it's, I'm of the mindset where it's, it's needed. For example, this afternoon I'm, I'm on the chamber board yep. and I'll have a chamber of commerce board meeting this afternoon. During the school year, I read to pre-K students as part of the Partnership for Children, Real Men Read. Real Men Read. Real Men Read. Yeah, where we... Now tell us what, how that'll work. Well, it, the aim is to put a positive male role model into the classroom where pre-K students are, four-year-olds, because some may come from broken homes. Four-year-olds. Yes, yeah, pre-K. And you read a book once a month, and each kid gets the book. They get to take a copy of the book home with them. And they're sitting there, Indian-style 
listening to you, listening to the book. We go through the book, and then I'll quiz them on what was in the book afterward. Well, what was this animal's name? What was he doing? And then I'll ask them at the end of it, because most of them are four years old. They can't read. And I'll say, what are you going to do with the book? And I, I coach them into learning to say, we're going to take it home and let my mom read it, my dad, my mom, my mima, my papa, my nanny, or if I have an old, older brother or sister, or if I have an aunt or an uncle, if I have a friend. And then I said, you also don't have to read to be able to tell the story. You can look at the pictures. If you have a younger brother or sister, you can read this to them as well. You can make up your own story based on the pictures. And, and hopefully, this has been my whole feeling about working with the prison um, population, working with the students in any of the schools, um, working as a member of a, the Freemasons. If, if you can make a difference in one person's life, you make a difference in the whole world over. Widows and orphans. Widows and orphans, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I want to uh, turn the page back for a minute and think of that guy's, the driver was Bostic. Yeah, yeah, uh, Richard Bostic. You helped him, then he helped you. Yes. And that's, and that's so much about how, what life's really about. Well, it is, and, and the whole thing about character is, uh, I guess, the sign of being a, a man, one of the signs of being a good person, not a man, but a good person is giving something to someone when there is nothing at all you're expecting to have in return. Right. And I, I expected to gain nothing from that. Two things as humans that we try to do, we try to avoid conflict and confrontation. Right. And we try to help others. Most of us do. Yep. And that can get us in trouble sometimes, but I like to be able to help people. If yep. someone says, hey, can you do me a favor? I like to be able to say yes. It feels good to know that you've helped someone who's in need. Yep. Uh, Jody, call as we reciprocate in those, uh, that arena of giving and taking and giving and sharing and caring. Uh, what do you do here? What, what do I do here? Tell us about the, the Jody Call that yeah. we probably don't know. Tell us about your leadership role at Wilkes Communications. Yes, it's a, it changes daily, but uh, as I started as a network engineer and, and I've progressed through levels of management and that's all been under our CEO, Eric Kramer. He has seen something in me that um, I've not seen in myself and, and I understand that because I think I also see that in some of our employees who report to me. Uh, and how many do we have? Uh, we have about 150 here. About 80 of them are part of operations. And so I see things in employees and untapped potential that they don't see in themselves. Sometimes you have to step outside to be able to see it. And so he, is, he has seen that in me, so I appreciate his recognition and support of me in doing that. But, but as far as what operations does, um, anyone any of the employees who come out and install the service at a home, whether it be internet, telephone, television, if they have to repair it, like during the lightning storms we've had dozens and dozens of outages. The technicians who work in the hidden dark locations who make, the, make sure the internet works for everyone, the backbone. That's the backbone? Yeah, yep, yep. Our <laughs> dispatch, which is our technical support, who takes the calls of frustrated customers or to schedule installation. Our information technology, the, the employees here who support our employees' computer needs and network needs. The business and security folks who install security systems and camera systems for home security. And I think that's, a, that's about it. But it, it's a pretty large group and we, we feel like a family. I, everybody who works here is an asset, is a, is a great employee. This has been a great opportunity for Gary York. Yeah. This, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to be here each week is just uh, such a, an encouragement in my life right now. Tell us, go back to Eric a minute. Yeah. And uh, you said he sees things in me that maybe I don't see myself. Uh, that that uh, significant leader that to make great things happen, and, and the, you mentioned three things about Maintaining and improving yeah, and yeah, growing. Yeah. Uh, let's talk the about network. that. Yes, yeah, so things can get so 
complicated in how we operate as a company. And I don't try to downplay the importance or significance of what we do, but we have two jobs as far as in operations, and that is to maintain the network for our customers and then to upgrade it because, as we know, everything becomes obsolete yeah. and planned obsolescence. Uh, Quickly is, in this industry. It is. In this industry, every day something's changing. And it, it truly is on the bleeding edge of technology. But the third thing that I've added to that recently is to grow the network. So you maintain the network. When it goes out, you make sure it's re repaired and restored as soon as possible. We plan to upgrade it. And there are five, 10, 20 year plans that we are constantly working on. And then grow the network. In our industry that is largely been government funded in the past for rural areas, we have had to find other ways to replace revenue where we've lost support from the government. And the only way to do that is to grow. And that can be done by either organically growing outside of Wilkes County or within Wilkes County or purchasing other companies. It's a lot easier to purchase companies and add on customers immediately that has revenue because building a fiber network, for us to put one mile of fiber in the ground, it's $45,000 just for the construction and the materials to put that fiber on the side of the road to bury. Now, why is fiber so vital to this industry? Tell our, our customer, our viewer this morning, this is why fiber is so important. So you, you have a few different technologies, the way you can deliver communication services. Traditionally, telephone lines are copper lines that yep. come to your house, and they've been installed since the 40s or 50s or maybe 60s. And there was a sizable investment in putting that infrastructure there. And so companies, especially larger companies than us, the regional and national carriers, they try to get every last bit of mileage out of that cable because comparatively, fiber optic communications cost so much more to install. With copper, you have the issues with the, how far it goes. After about three or four miles, the data speeds, the data rate, the download you can get on it drops off significantly. With fiber optic, we, use fi we don't use it, but the industry uses fiber optic communications to connect the United States to England, the United States to South America. We've not seen the upper limits of what the speeds are or the bandwidth is for fiber optic communications. So that's why it's important to us is because it is, it is almost as future-proof as future-proof can be in a technology to, to deliver internet services. Now I want to switch to uh, being a community advocate yeah. and uh, just touch on the Hall of Fame and some things you do that, uh, yeah. that are so meaningful to us and to you. Right, so I, I was asked to be on the Hall of Fame board I think three years ago, it was actually the year that Mr. Enoch Staley was, was inducted into the Hall of Fame posthumously. And I was really impressed with, with how that whole show was produced. It's unique. Do you know that? It is very it unique. It is very unique. And it's a hidden gem in Wilkes. And so I was, I was uh, flattered to be asked to be on that board and and so we we try to recognize those who are in Wilkes who are from Wilkes who have contributed to the good of the county and there's a long list and it's a very tough decision we try to choose eight to ten people per year to be not uh, to be inducted and after you've submitted after someone has been submitted for a uh, consideration of a nomination, their name stays in the hat. It, it's not a recurring process that they have to redo it. Right. So every year we have to go, in January, we start going around the table to determine who is worthy and well qualified to be able to do that uh, for that year. Um, so that, that's a vital part of, of uh, preserving Wilkes County's history. I'm also on the Chamber of Commerce board. Next year I'll be the um, the, the chairman of the Chamber of Commerce, and I'm also the vice president of youth leadership. Tell us about for that. The, for the chamber. Yep. Uh, 
We have a program called UTA and T3LC, which is United Teens in Action, and also T3LC. Dennis Huggins. Dennis Huggins, right. and now Morgan uh, Mathis takes care of that. Right. So it's a youth philanthropy group for four high school students per high school and two for the early college. Their junior year, they are recommended for this, for their outstanding philanthropy and contributions in their, their attitude and personality. And they do this on their own time. They miss school, but in its unexcused absences, they have to make up this time. And we meet once per month when with their UTA, they are juniors in school, and they will come up with a community service project. We've done service projects of helping uh, elementary school students be able to dress up and wear silly outfits and hopefully help with their self-esteem and we've also uh, read books to students. We've had... The Leonard Herring family played a key role in Leonard Herring that family program. Is, is, a, is the major contributor yes. to that yep. each year and we're lucky for that family to continue that contribution and, and well, for everything they've done up to this point, even if they were to stop now, what they've done is monumental. And we contribute also from Wilkes Communications uh, for the administrative cost uh, that it costs to, to have the consultant who comes in, yeah. so we match that. And then T3LC is the senior year. That's where they do a request for proposals to help school-age students with some of these projects. And one of the notable ones that keeps coming up every year that gets uh, rewarded is uh, Exceptional Children's Prom. And that, oh gives, that gives the EC population an opportunity to have their own prom if they want to attend that. And, and we just hope that that keeps coming in every year as a request because that continues to make a difference in lives, and as I said, if it makes a difference in one life. In your reading program, you also have been involved in a, a hygiene program for youngsters. <laughs> yeah. I just thought that was just a Well, every, wonderful. every year when we do Real Men Read, I, I will also go at Christmas, and you've seen Elf on the Shelf. I'll go at Christmas and I'll show them, because I do Elf on the Shelf um, reading to my children, I've done so. And I'll share with them what our elf does, the annex he's up to at home. And I'll, read, I'll go at Halloween and read Halloween books. So I go extra days that, that are not part of the, the planned, I guess, curriculum or the schedule. I just like being around them. And, and then on the la near the last day of school, I will go and I'll, I'll get, this year I bought coloring books and crayons before I've bought little action figures and, and Barbie dolls. And, and this year I've, I've noticed with the students and um, I, I've seen it more and more that a, a lot of children have uh, decaying teeth. Already. Already and, and, and a lot of metal crowns. And, and so I asked the, the teacher, Miss Shannon Walker at Mulberry, yeah. And I said, would you be offended if, if I come back near the end of school to bring them something, but also bring them toothbrushes and, and show them how to brush their teeth properly? I said, if it makes a difference in one kid's life, just like learning to properly wash your hands and wipe your hands with the <laughs> towel and grab the, the door handle, then throw the towel away, it can make a huge difference. And, and so, she said, yeah, absolutely. So I, I bought two packs of toothbrushes for every student. I think I had 16 students. And I had some, you, you wind them up almost like the little dolls that walk, but it's these <laughs> chompy teeth with eyes on them. And, and I remembered Susan Cogdell, who's yeah. over the community sure. partnership. She was the one who was a dental hygienist when I was in kindergarten and first grade. And so they would bring the plaque tablets and show all of this. So I thought, I don't think this program is in the school anymore. So I did that, took them to toothbrushes and showed them with my own toothbrush how to brush the teeth and the tongue. And, and I also told them, I said, this toothbrush should last you through the summer and you have a spare. And if you have a little brother or little sister, give them that toothbrush and show them how to brush their teeth. If you don't have a brother or sister, keep it for yourself or an extra. How about, uh, I want to close with, uh being the family that rescues animals. Yeah. Yeah, we, 
so I grew up. You have a son and daughter. Yeah, I have a daughter. I have my wife is Melissa. I have a son Carter. He's eleven. I have a daughter Sophia. She's fourteen. She wants to be a veterinarian. She volunteers at Riverview Animal Hospital with Dr. Rob Miller. She's done that the past two summers. Um, when I grew up on Speedway Road, being that it was old US 421, uh, if we did not have dogs on a leash or inside, a lot of times they met their end because of that road, because cars going really fast. And so when I moved uh, onto the Little Brushy Mountains where my mom's home place where she was born and raised in the 40s, when I moved up there and, and we live we, we started out with five acres and we've grown the property buying other family property. It was my goal just to have animals who could run free. And, and so we have 10 dogs and five cats now. And people will set animals out. And I don't want this video to be anything to where people are like, oh, I can go set animals out at Jody's house. <laughs> but uh, some have been set out near our house and we take them in some that we just find on the side of the road when we're on our way to work or somewhere and we take them in have them spayed or neutered and take care of them wow and what a wonderful tribute it, it is uh, your heart you have servant's heart i've i've learned that about you in two or three days here i've known about you from afar and what an honor to get to know you uh, jody call and I hope you'll come back again. Can I have one more thing? One more thing. Yeah. You got it. So as far as part of, as part of giving and, and helping brothers and sisters out, I had become a Freemason a few years ago, and that's about helping others, as you well know. And there was a gentleman who was in World War II, and he was an airplane pilot, and his name was Paul Henderson. And he lived in Michigan. He retired as a machinist for General Motors. I think it was General Motors. It was Detroit, Michigan, so it was a car factory. And he had moved down here, and his wife had passed away some 20 years ago. Very small man, lucky to even be five feet tall. But we were sitting before a Masonic meeting uh, at Lodge one night, Liberty Lodge number 45, and he was getting ready to turn 97. This was October. We were actually bagging Halloween candy for the kids for Halloween. And he said, my birthday's in February. I'll be 97. And I said, well, Paul, as long as you've lived and you had a good job and you were in the military, you saw the world, what is there that you've not done? And he said, well, I've never ridden in a helicopter. And I said, Really? I said, but you were an airplane pilot? He said, yeah, but I never got to ride in a helicopter. And so my mind started turning, and I went outside immediately, and my father-in-law was a retired airplane corporate pilot for Holly Farms. And I called my father-in-law, and I said, do you know anyone who flies a helicopter? And he did, but the, the individual was on medical leave. So I put a word out without Paul knowing it, to the Lodge of North Carolina and let our other Lodge members know. I said, I want to do this for his birthday. I want it to be a surprise. And we were able to get other Masons um, from the Grand Lodge and also a Lodge down past Raleigh to fly a helicopter up. And we had a birthday party for Paul at our Lodge. And it was a surprise that helicopter landed beside the Lodge. And without him knowing, we got him out right when the helicopter was coming down and it landed, and I, remember, and I have pictures of this and videos, and, and he, I remember saying, that's for you. And we put him in the helicopter, and they flew him around for about 30 minutes, and, and then they landed, and he said, that's the best birthday present I could ever had, and, and unfortunately, oh. he passed away just a few months later. So you see an opportunity, you seize it, and matters in the life, the life of another. And that's the whole, that, that's not only, being, being a Mason is just about being a good man. Yeah. There's no trickery or secretive stuff there. And it just enforces the virtues, the values, the morals that you should already have as a human yeah. being. And another key element of being a human is wanting to help people. And again, I think we made the difference for one person. And you're doing that in countless ways. Gary York, people doing good for others. Please commit to being with us next week. I hope you will. 
So the opportunities that we can seek and find ways to serve God, family, friends, and worthy causes. And I look forward to being with you next week. Take care. Bye-bye.